This is the Cato Daily Podcast for Friday, January 3rd, 2020. I'm Caleb Brown. How well does the Community Reinvestment Act work to protect low-income people from discrimination in housing finance? Cato's Diego Zuluaga has found that many of the benefits of the act appear to flow to gentrifiers, moderate to high-income borrowers, not the act's intended recipients. We spoke about some forthcoming changes to the act last month. The Community and Reinvestment Act is aimed at getting uh, housing capital to people so that they can, uh, can own homes, so that they can make the one pretty good decision that most people tend to make in their lives in the United States. But uh, a lot of the rules that govern are within the Community and Reinvestment Act haven't been very good and have not targeted properly the things that they were supposed to target. Is that fair? I think that's fair. The The CRA was enacted in 1977 to address what was called redlining, this perceived practice by financial institutions of avoiding certain neighborhoods, particularly minority and low-income ones. And obviously, the late 1970s were also a time of urban flight. There was a great deal of concern about urban decay. And the CRA sought to redress that by instructing regulators to evaluate banks about the extent to which their credit reached low-income communities and all of the communities where they have offices and branches. Now, the Act has been in place for 42 years. Uh, Some people argue it's been effective at getting lending to the communities that it targets. Other people argue that it's increased the risk in bank portfolios. And I myself have found that in the DC area in recent years, a lot of the lending that the CRA would reward is actually going to gentrifiers, to high-income borrowers moving into low-income areas because those loans still count. So about two-thirds of mortgages that qualify for CRA points between 2012 and 2017 went to these high-income borrowers. So these are people who uh, are moving into a low-income area, but on paper, they could get a a standard conforming loan uh, anywhere. They would still qualify, that's right. And uh, they're also simply not the target of of the CRA. At the time of its passage, it may have made sense to reward loans to those people because what legislators wanted to avoid was this emptying out of urban centers and then the decline in tax revenues and various other associated uh, harms that then contributed to continued urban decay. But right now where we have a flocking in to major urban centers of young people and young professionals, we're having the opposite effect. What we see is historic residents because of limits on housing supply being pushed out by the arrival of new residents. And my worry is that the CRE is only encouraging that kind of uh, activity. In fact, fact, my research also found that for every percentage point increase in mortgage lending in CRA areas in DC, you had a three percentage point decline in the minority share of the population in that particular area, which is a concerning, it doesn't mean that there's a causal link, but it's a concerning trend. And there, and there as, you, as you alluded to, there are numerous other factors at work that have nothing to do with uh, targeting low income and minority people for uh, extending credit for the purposes of of buying homes. There are, as you say, housing supply restrictions and that sort of thing. Absolutely. And then job opportunities and then, you know, people's ability to increase their income with education. There are very many factors, but I don't think that public policy should foment uh, foment a a kind of trend that may hurt the least well off, given the circumstances in which we live. The good news, Caleb, is that we had a a new rule applying CRA proposed uh, in December. And that rule takes out loans to high-income borrowers in low-income areas, among other things, from CRA qualifying activities. So my hope is, and this was my recommendation, which I'm happy that the regulators have taken on board, my hope is that as a result of that, not only will we only reward loans to the people that the CRA actually intends to help, but we can then also use the data that emerges from that to evaluate how useful and effective the CRA is, because it's part of the statute to say, these loans have to be consistent with the prudent management of banks. They cannot increase portfolio risk. And that's an open question about whether the CRA is able to do that. And now with this rule change, we can finally test it. And there are multiple regulators that are tasked with some job under the CRA. What 
what agencies do that? So the banking regulatory system, as most people know, is very complex. Uh, but we have three main regulators as far as banks are concerned, the institutions that are subject to the CRA. And those are the Office of the Controller of the Currency, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and the Federal Reserve. The first two, OCC and FDIC, have signed up to this joint proposal, and they regulate about 85% of banks by assets that are subject to CRA. The Fed only regulates around 15%, but it has declined to join this proposal rule at this stage. Uh, the reasons for that are somewhat baffling, at least to me, because the type of bank that the Fed regulates is a relatively large regional bank. So not one of the largest institutions, but not, not, not one of the tiniest banks either. And since the CRA, one of the enforcement tools that it gives regulators is the ability to block mergers and expansions by banks that don't perform well, you would have thought that the Fed being a regulator for institutions that are very likely to want to expand and merge in the future, that they would uh, consider modernizing CRA a, a significant priority, but they haven't for the moment. And the problem there is that by getting inconsistency in CRA evaluations across regulators, you are only making uh, compliance more costly, which is the opposite of what was intended with this reform. So if the, if the nominal purpose of the CRA was to better serve communities with uh, extending mortgage credit to or, or homeowning credit uh, to people who were uh, not qualifying for traditional loans or were consciously being excluded uh, by banks because of some risk they thought was posed by uh, some geographic area. Um, how well does the CRA at its best actually address those goals as compared with the technological innovation that we've seen in the last 15 years in banking? The idea is that in certain contexts, banks don't have sufficient information to lend in certain neighborhoods. If there have been very few home transactions or small business transactions in a rundown neighborhood for decades, banks will be reluctant to lend, not because of any prejudice against any individual borrower, because they want to consciously avoid that area, but because the property values, for example, will be uncertain. And so they don't trust appraisals. And so making loans is a riskier proposition than it would be in other places. The hope is that with the CRA, because banks now have to lend in those areas, a market will emerge and that information will eventually become available to the benefit of everybody. But you're absolutely right to suggest that technology offers much greater hope, in my view, uh, for credit to be extended to people who were previously uh, underserved, whether it's communities in which you have no bank branches but online lenders are reaching to, which the evidence suggests, or whether it's individual borrowers that don't have a long credit history but have stable employment and they actually manage the finances well, and so underwriting them in a different way to the traditional ways actually suggests that they would be good credits. To what extent does the CRA, and maybe this proposed rule speaks to that as well, to what extent does the CRA dictate the um, metrics that banks must use when evaluating individuals for extending credit? The CRA doesn't dictate specific metrics that banks should use, but this proposal, and this is part of the plan that Comptroller Rodding, who is the regulator who's been leading this effort at reform, this is one of the things that he was very keen on. The proposed rule does include a much more quantitative approach than has traditionally been the case with CRA enforcement. So one big criticism of the CRA in the past was that it was vague. It was just saying, well, banks must lend effectively. They must do a good job of lending everywhere they have activity, which is good if you have omniscient and regulators that know what words mean and how to interpret them and, and implement them. But we're all human, and it's difficult sometimes to ensure consistency across the board. The problem with the proposal, as far as I'm concerned, is that it's overly prescriptive. It has a lot of ratios about how many of your mortgage and small business loans uh, as a share of your deposits should go to people of different incomes and areas of different incomes, how you might compare with other institutions. And I don't think that it's the job of the regulator or indeed the ability of the regulator to actually ascertain what at what ratio is adequate. After all, we live in a competitive banking system, and it's only uh, a reality that in certain circumstances, certain institutions will be particularly good at serving, serving certain people. And the other banks that on paper don't look like they're doing such a good job, it's probably because they're not particularly competitive in that area. And so it's a dynamic process, and trying to assume that these are somehow fixed ratios that can easily demonstrate 
a bank's ability to serve its community, I think that's a fantasy. Uh, and you imagine, and our the our experience with the financial crisis probably ought to tell us this, is that banks, borrowers, and inter- various intermediaries are going to be constantly trying to game whatever system exists. Absolutely. And I don't even think that the finding I had in the DC area about most loans going to gentrifiers, that that was a conscious policy of the banks. I just thought that banks have very many different goals at the same time. They have to remain safe and sound. They have to give their shareholders a good return. And they have to comply with measures like the CRA. And given the existing rules, uh, of course, what that leads to is a situation where you lend in the in all of the areas where you have activity, but you will tend to lend to the most creditworthy people who apply. And that inevitably will lead you to a situation where higher income people get more of the loans because income correlates with ability to repay and ability to acquire a home. So even if the banks have no evil intentions, that's just the situation you end up in. Aside from adopting your proposal, are there other good ideas built into this hundreds of pages of proposed rule that uh, these agencies have put forth? 240 pages to be specific. I I like two other elements of the proposal. One is that it exempts uh, banks under $500 million in assets from the new rules. So they now get the ability to opt into either the old or the new system. And that will give us an idea of how attractive the new system is relative to the old one in terms of adaptation and so on. Uh, And that covers, by the way, three quarters of banks in the United States. So a lot of the institutions. And that removes a lot of the uncertainty, which is also why I'm Slightly surprised that the Fed didn't sign up because it covers a lot of their concerns anyway. The second piece I really like is that the CRA for the first time will include areas where banks have a lot of activity but no branches into the calculation, which I think is future oriented and good. We have more and more online activity going on in banking, but we also have online players wanting to become banks. They're currently fintech lenders. They only do lending. They don't take deposits. But as and when they become depository institutions, they'll have to comply with the CRA. But if you have an institution that only has one office in Salt Lake City, Utah, for example, but they have nationwide activity, you shouldn't count only their activity in Utah for CRA purposes. You should count it nationwide. And for the first time, if you're an institution with 50% or more of your deposits taken out outside your main office, you will be evaluated in all of the major areas of the country where you have activity. I think that's good because it's a better gauge of community lending performance, but it's also a way to take account of the fact that banks are increasingly not operating in physical locations, but online. I remember there was a debate, I guess it was in the 70s or the 80s, over whether or not an ATM actually was a branch. That's right. And uh, eventually in the 90s, ATMs were included in CRA evaluations. So it's been 25 years since we had a major review of the CRA. It's long overdue. And I still have my uh, some some skepticism about the CRA's ability in future to achieve its goals however good the implementation is. But I think the reforms go in the right direction and we will finally have uh, greater ability to test the CRA for performance. And the bottom line is that technology is doing a, a, a really good job at addressing a lot of these stated concerns about discrimination Uh, and so-called redlining. That's right. If you look at mortgage lending data, um, it's actually the non-banks that lend the most as a share of their lending to low and moderate income communities, and often to minorities uh, as well. This is not to suggest that banks are doing less than they should, but rather that the innovators are going to the underserved communities first, which are minority and low-income Americans for reasons of documentation and credit history and various other things. So we are seeing innovation cater to the people that have uh, been outside the mainstream uh, for a long time. Diego Zuluaga is a policy analyst at the Cato Institute. Subscribe to the Cato Daily Podcast wherever you please and follow us on Twitter at Cato Podcast. 